and poet Leila Shati. Uh, Rowan and Leila will be reading from their very new books, uh, Starling Days, published by The Overlook Press and Deluge from Copper Canyon Press, respectively. Our next event will be on October 6, and will feature Anthony Doris, 2015 Pulitzer winning All the Light We Cannot See, with Leslie Tenorio for The Son of Good Fortune and Quan Barry for We Ride Upon Sticks. Um, so Wisconsin Wednesdays is an online reading series brought to you by the UW Madison Program in Creative Writing and the Wisconsin Book Festival. In light of the current health crisis, Wisconsin Wednesdays was designed to continue with the program and foundation's practice of hosting brilliant writers, many of them alumni of the program, currently promoting their new books, along with rising to the challenge of social distancing measures and the inability to gather in person. We hope that Wisconsin Wednesdays through its virtual platform is also able to carry out the Wisconsin idea upon which UW was founded on, which declares that the borders of the university are the borders of the state. So we welcome you, whether you're joining us from Madison, Milwaukee, Marshfield, Marinette, Mineral Point, Mananami, Manitowoc, Mequon, or anywhere else in the state, the US or the world, uh, or the world, yeah. <laughs> you may notice that a number of our events are on a Tuesday, uh, but you may also agree that Wisconsin Wednesdays simply rolls off the tongue in such a smooth and pleasing way. Um, so we'd like also to take a moment uh, to thank and promote our partnering independent bookstores from all over Wisconsin. Um, we've got Arumo of One Zone in Madison, The Village Booksmith at Baraboo, Honest Dog Books in Bayfield, Inklink Books in East Troy, Daughters Books in Eau Claire, Fox Den Books in River Falls, and Arcadia Books in Spring Green. Please continue to support your local bookstores throughout this pandemic and consider placing an order for Rowan and Layla's books through any of these establishments tonight. Most offer shipping and contactless curbside pickup. Um, we hope to have our, our, our webpage up very soon and you can find their uh, contact information there. Before we proceed with the reading, um, we'd also like to recognize that Wisconsin Wednesdays is being broadcasted to you from Tijo traditional Ho-Chunk land historically ceded and occupied through unjust legislations and treaties, such as the Indian Removal Act of 1830. We recognize the Ho-Chunk as the original and true stewards of this land and honor their continued resilience and resistance, along with that of the 11 other First Nations that reside in the area of this state. Layla is joining us from Cincinnati, the traditional land of the Miami and Shawnee peoples, and Roan is joining us from the UK. Finally, in the spirit of resilience and humanity's collective capacity for resourcefulness, we'd like to thank you viewers for your patience with this new online format. Um, please bear with us should there be any technical issues that may arise during the reading. Um, we'll also have time for some Q&A with the authors after they both read. Please use the box at the bottom of the Crowdcast page to submit any questions you have for the authors at any time during the reading. We'll also do our very best to accommodate your queries during the event. And so um, I'd like to now introduce our first reader, Rowan Hisayo Buchanan. Rowan is a Japanese, British, Chinese, Australian, uh, sorry, American. Oh. <laughs> Let's go through that again. Japanese, British, Chinese, American writer who received her BA from Columbia and an MFA from right here at UW Madison. Rowan is the author of Harmless Like You, published in 2016 through Norton and Starling Days, published this year with the Overlook Press. Harmless Like You has received praise from Laurie Moore, who dubbed the book as a brilliant debut and cause for celebration, and cemented Rowan as, quote, a startling talent by The Guardian. They are also the editor of Go Home, an anthology of contemporary Asian diasporic writing published in cooperation with the Asian American Writers Workshop. Rowan's work also appears in places such as Granta, Guernica, The Guardian, and The Paris Review. She's received generous support from the McDowell Colony, the Malay Colony, Hedgebrook, Gladstone Library, AAWW, and Kundiman. They are currently based in the UK where they're working on a PhD at the University of East Anglia. So tonight, Rowan will be reading from Starling Days, her second novel. Elaine Castillo, author of America's Not the Heart, describes the book as, quote, a beautiful and profoundly moving floor plan of what it means to live with depression and dailiness, love and death, solitude and connection. T. Kira Madden, author of Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, calls, calls the novel, quote, another supreme gift from Rowan and a rare opportunity to love and forgive our darkest and most shimmering selves. 
Starling Days tells the story of Mina and her newly married husband, Oscar, whom navigate life together and individually as Mina's clinical depression intensifies. Throughout the book, the couple examines the many ways we enact care and harm towards ourselves and others. And the novel explores the simultaneous liberating power and futility of language in the expression of suffering. Writes Spencer Kwong in the Paris Review, Quote, in the darkest moments of the cycle, Starling Days is, heart is heartbreaking to read, and yet most days I close the book with immense gratitude for its refusal to pathologize family history or identity. It feels rare, he continues, in both literature and in our world to sit with sadness and allow it to be unruly. Buchanan proves that, uh, proves that to recognize some sadness is unalterable is not necessarily a melodramatic plunge into despair, end quote. So it's a profound honor to kick off Wisconsin Wednesdays with this brilliant writer. Please join me in welcoming Rowan Hisayo Buchanan. Thank you so much all for being here. And I now feel terribly much more important than I did only a few minutes ago. So I am going to read to you a little bit from the opening of Starling Days. This is actually the British edition. I hope you'll forgive me. And yeah, let's start. So this is just a few pages in, so you don't need to know very much other than that Mina has been walking along the George Washington Bridge and sort of thinking about sort of that her husband doesn't know that she's there and some other things, but let's just drop into the book. The river was as dark as poor tarmac. They said that when a body fell onto water from this height, it was like hitting the sidewalk. Golden Gate Bridge had nets to stop jumpers. She imagined the feeling of a rope cutting into arms and legs. Your body would flop like a fish. How long did they have to lie there before someone scooped them out? There was nothing like that here. People said that drowning was a good death, that the tiny alveoli of the lungs filled like a thousand water balloons. She lifted one purple flip-flop and dropped it over the river. She didn't hear it hit. The shape simply vanished into the black shadow. That was when the lights got brighter and a voice, male and certain, lobbed into her ears. Ma'am, step away from the rail. The police car's lights flashed blue and white and red. Once she'd had an ice pop those colors and the sugary water had pooled behind her teeth. Ma'am, step away from the rail. Good evening, officer. Have I done something wrong? Mina asked. Please get into the car, he said. There were two of them. The other was younger and he was speaking into a radio. It was hard to make out his words over the wind and traffic. Was he talking about her? This is a public walkway, Mina said. It was open. I haven't done anything wrong. Ma'am, get into the car. I don't want to get into the car. Look, I was just getting some air. I was thinking, I'll go home now. Ma'am, don't make me come over there. Mina had never been in a police car. She'd read once that the back doors only open from the outside. Who knew what would happen if she got into the car? The window was rolled down and the cop stuck his head out. There was a lump on his upper lip, a pimple perhaps. Where are your shoes? It's hot out, she said. Where are your shoes? I don't want to tell you about my shoes, she said. I'm gonna, I've done nothing wrong. I'm an American citizen. Ma'am, where are your shoes? She lifted the single flip-flop she had left. The other one broke? she said. Behind him, other cars continued into the night. Did they even notice her standing in the dark, a small woman with bare legs and feet? She was aware of the bluing bruise she'd caught banging her knee on the subway door. In the shower that morning, she'd skipped shaving her legs. In the beam of his headlamps, could he see hairs standing up in splinters? Ma'am, I really need you to get into the car. I can't leave you here. What if something happened to you? In his voice, she heard the insinuation that normal women, innocent women, didn't walk alone on bridges at night. I'm fine, she said. 
Mina knew her stubby ponytail was frizzy, bleaching black to Marilyn Monroe blonde had taken four rounds of peroxide. Now it stood up in breaking strands. If she'd conditioned it, would this cop think she was sane? If she'd blow dried it, would he let her go home? And of course, there were the tattoos twining up her arms. We can talk about it in the car, he said. His shadowed friend was bent over the radio, lips to the black box. Mina was tired. It was the heat or perhaps the wind. So she got into the car. The seat was smooth. Someone must have chosen the fabric specially. This must be wipeable and disinfectable. People probably spat on this seat. They probably pissed on purpose and by mistake. Between the front and back seats was a grill. She would not be able to reach out to touch the curve of the cop's ear or straighten his blue collar. The flip-flop lay across her knees. The cops wanted to know her name, address, phone number and social security. She gave them. We're taking you to Mount Sinai, said the cop. I was just going for a walk, clearing my head. I don't need to be in hospital. I was just clearing my head. Damn, repeating yourself was a habit of the guilty. Mina tried to slow her breath. See it from my point of view, he said. You're walking alone on the bridge at night. I can't let you out. I don't know what would happen. Only then did she understand that they must do this every night, drive back and forth across the bridge, looking for people like her. I have to go to work tomorrow, she said. My husband will want to know where I am. Please, please, just let me go to the subway. We can't do that, ma'am. Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead a tiny bit. What happened in the meantime is that she negotiates that it will be okay for her to go to an ambulance that's waiting by the bridge rather than going to hospital if her husband can come and pick her up and say he's responsible for her and if the paramedic says it's okay because the paramedic has to okay at first so. the, the paramedic returned with a clipboard Mina noticed then how pretty she was, how neat her hair. The paramedic's lips were lipstick to dark red. Mina had once owned a dress almost that color. Oxblood, the store called it. Nice lipstick, Mina said. Thank you, the paramedic smiled. I just want to go home. Did that sound too desperate? Mina disliked the clipboard. We have to do a quick checkup, the paramedic said. Can you give me your full name? Mina, she said, then paused, Umeda. She'd only had her husband's name for six months and it still felt itchy. To most people, she suited the Japanese name. Mina was short with a small flat nose. People never guessed that her DNA came from heavy bellied China, not Japan's skinny island chain. It was Oscar who puzzled people with his mixed race face and English accent. The clipboard was uninterested in the intricacies of naming. It wanted to know the same things as the police, name, phone number, social security, and address. It was as if this one long number and these few lines could tell them all they needed to know. They would probably be the first things asked for when she was dead. Mina gave detail after detail away to the stranger. She said, can I ask your name? Sunny, said Sunny. Sunny shone a light in Mina's left and right eyes. She asked Mina to stick her arm out and then wrapped a gray tube around it. Her touch was gentle as she sealed the Velcro. This is for blood pressure. Oh, that's a bit low. Don't worry, Mina said, it's always been low. Mine too, it's common in women our age, Sunny said, unwrapping the arm. Mina wanted to take Sunny's hand and feel the low pulse of the blood. She wanted to say thank you for not asking anything difficult. This won't hurt. Sunny placed a plastic grip around her finger and took note of numbers on a machine without comment. So, said Sunny, how have you been feeling emotionally? I'm fine, I was just clearing my head. Were you clearing it of anything in particular? Mina tried to see what the paramedic saw. What would Sunny make of Mina? 
This patient was an East Asian woman wearing a black tank top and black shorts. A woman with peonies tattooed up her arms to hide the fine trellis of scars from her teenage years. A woman who didn't bother blow drying her hair. A woman who looked younger than she was. A woman in bare feet who let her pedicure grow out so that only the tips of her toes were striped in gold. A woman with a single purple flip-flop. In Sunny's place, would Mina believe this woman? A hard knock at the door. Oscar, Mina said. There was her husband. He looked like a real adult. They would trust him, yet a linen shirt. That's my husband, they said. My husband could pick me up. Sunny did not offer Oscar a hand into the ambulance. She asked him to wait outside. Once the door was shut with Oscar on the other side, Sunny spoke. Mina, I need you to tell me how you've been feeling. I've been feeling fine, I was just thinking. What were you thinking about? I can't remember now, not with all of this. Mina didn't know why she couldn't lie better. She wanted to lie. She wanted to say, I was thinking about my job or where we should go on vacation or the trash schedule. Her lips didn't know how to make anything about her life sound convincing. I just want to go home with my husband. They said I could go home with my husband and you're safe with him. He's never, Sunny trailed off and all the things Oscar had never done hung there. Oh no, never, not Oscar. I want to go home with him, my husband, she said. He's here to pick me up. They'd been married for only six months, but they'd been together for a decade. The switch from boyfriend to husband felt strange. The word husband sounded so stodgy, like my attorney or my Ford Focus hatchback. Tonight, though, she loved it. And I'm going to leave that there. Thank you for listening. I'm on mute. I'm very sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Rowan. Um, it's now my absolute joy to introduce um, Leila Shati. Uh, Leila is a Tunisian American poet and the author of Chapbooks Ed from New Generation African Poets and Tunisia Amrikia, the 2017 editor selection from Bull City Press. Her, her full length debut collection, Deluge, was published by Copper Canyon just this year. Um, Layla has an MFA from North Carolina State University, um, where she was awarded the Academy of American Poets Prize. She's currently pursuing a PhD at the University of Cincinnati in Ohio, where she's a provost fellow. Layla is the recipient of numerous fellowships and was, rec and was recently the inaugural, inaugural Annisfield Wolf Fellow in Writing and Publishing at Cleveland State University. She's received support from the Wisconsin in Institute of Creative Writing, um, Tin House, Key West Literary Sem Seminars, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, and other institutions, and was a finalist for the 2020 Ruth Lee and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship. Layla is the consulting poetry editor at the Rally Review, and her work has appeared in places like Narrative, Plowshares, American Poetry Review, VQR, and elsewhere. Deluge, which Layla will be reading from tonight, chronicles a physical, spiritual, social, and even textual journey that begins with a condition the author developed in her early 20s, a bleeding that physicians referred to as, quote, flooding. Like satellites around the planet or a star, Shati's threads on the female body, agency, identity, divinity, punishment, and shame deftly weave and revolve around the central figure of Mary, present in both the Quran and the Bible. Of Deluge, Naomi Shiab Nye writes, quote, to write a series of poems out of extreme illness is a bracing accomplishment indeed. Shati finds not dissociation, but deeper association with her own experience, unquote. In a starred review, Publishers Weekly notes that Deluge, quotes, quote, translates a gritty, traumatizing experience into an hypnotic, transcendental topography of the human spirit. Now, on a personal note, I had the privilege of getting to know Leila during my first year of the MFA while she was the Ron Wallace Fellow at UW. And one of my fondest earliest memories of Madison, I don't know if she remembers this, was sitting with her on the floor of Accord's apartment, snacking on wine and stovetop quesadillas after a spontaneous night of dancing downtown, where it turns out in Wisconsin, all you need to be to be a good dancer is have the willingness to try. Um, I remember being so in awe of Leila and her work as early as then, and to witness this poet hero being brilliant and frankly wildly hilarious in real time and in real life has been such a formative guiding light for me. I treasure her work and her tuna tagine. I'm thrilled she's with us tonight. Please welcome, please join us in welcoming Leila Shanti.
Oh, Mishka, that was that was so sweet. This is so nice. I feel um, even from a different part of the Midwest at home um, in Wisconsin, and I miss I miss it very much. So thank you. It's so wonderful to to be here with you all. Um, all right, I'm gonna hop in. Um, I don't usually talk very much between poems, which I think is um, maybe not always typical of poets. Um, but all I will say is that uh, the book um, is about uh, an illness, um, an experience with illness in my early 20s and um, grappling with that and all the, the sort of baggage that, that bubbled up um, through that. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read is, is called Confession. And it begins with an epigraph um, when Mary is giving birth to Jesus in the Holy Quran. Um, she says something very interesting. So she says, Or oh, I wish I had died before this and was in oblivion, forgotten. Truth be told, I like Mary a little better when I imagine her like this, crouched and cursing, a boy god pushing on her cervix. I like remembering she had a cervix, her body ordinary and so like mine. Girl sweat lacing rivulets like veins in the sand. Her small hands on her knees, not doves, but hands gripping a palm pressed to her spine, bronze whispering the coyures overhead. Oh, Mary, like a god, I too take pleasure in knowing you were not all holy, that ache could undo you like a knot. And suffering, I admire this girl who cared for a moment not about God or his plans, but her own distinct life. This fiercer Mary who'd disappear if it saved her, who'd howl to hell with salvation if it meant this pain. The blessed adolescent who squatted indignant in a desert, bearing his child like a secret she never wanted to hear. Mary speaks. And what could I say when he entered? Rude as a dream, bare flame of a man with wings and a man's not his own. I'd been raised a good girl to house my tongue and my mouth, to be hospitable towards strangers, suspicious of no one. Perhaps I'd have been better off to be wary, but I'd been waiting so long to hear God speak, I hadn't thought to think of what he might tell me. Sarcoma. When the doctor says the word sarcoma, I consider how it might be a nice name for a daughter, that good feminine A, the way parents name their children for all sorts of inappropriate things. Apples, for instance, or the place where the baby was conceived. And I trace my fingers over the barrel of my belly as he speaks, flesh distended beneath the blue tissue I wear for a dress, an ideal grief frock, throw away. And he says something about life expectancy, but of course I expect my life. So plain I thought nothing would ever take it. And while he explains, I cut my palms around my center, as if comforting a child or covering her ears. Litany while reading scripture in the gynecologic oncology waiting room. And God said, let there be blood. And God said, flood. And God said, good is a woman with fruit in her womb and not in her hand. And God said, sin. And God did not say, forgive. And God said, I will make a stormy wind. And God said, sun, a breath stirring. And God said, highly favored. And God said, condemned. And God said, I will blot out men whom I have created, for I am sorry that I have made them. And God said, listen, and sank a boy in her like a stone. Angel. After a month of asking, suddenly a voice. It says, you deserve that which has happened to you. It says, I see what you do with your long tearing hands. Maundering through the banalities of my life, it follows, speaking as if from a frosty bag of peas in the freezer aisle, speaking while I'm on my knees, scrubbing the bathroom floor, trying to love a man. Its speech is disquieting company, but company nonetheless. The TV left on and turned low. 
It desperately wants my attention, but is, is polite, which is its defining weakness. Sometimes I catch it stirring out of the corner of my eye, a glint at the end of my cat's whiskers, a spangle on the ceiling of indiscernible source. More often though, it looks like me, only a little off, like my reflection in the pregnant belly of a spoon. In fact, when I speak to it, I use my own name. I'm not sure if it minds. It repeats instead its refrain. It says, God has plans for you. It says, I didn't say they were good. Hymen. Second blood, I never knew you. After the first, scoured the bed for your blazing blot and came up empty. Perhaps I was born without you. A box with no prize inside, a Sunday with no cherry on top. God of good girls, God of matrimony, mother state, which I consider a distant country with a discordant tongue. Did you speak with God and conclude I hadn't use for you? Once I was small as your kin. So small and for such a long time, longer than I've lived, I fit inside my mother when she fit inside her mother, and so on and so forth, and further, a nest of matrons, knees and a beam, in which to be female is to be something like infinity, and was it determined then what kind of woman I would be? It seems I've always been frightened, little veil, of wedlock's lock, clicking shut, the heritable procession of women whispering in the aisle of my pulse, don't do, don't do, don't. And I haven't done this, the grave of men, the grave I've dug with the spade of pleasure. But wanting seal of want, I did want it, did choose to commit my life's greatest transgression with a benevolent accomplice. And so in the here before, you could say I am among the spared. What a mess this messlessness of you could have been in any number of lives my size, billowing specters of dresses on a line of possibility, lives in which I am the bridesmaid and you, maidenhead, the bride given away, where I am the acquired property and you, the red ribbon severed in the threshold, I, the purse, and you, the coin tendered. Perhaps no one ever told you, precious emblem of innocence, simulacrum for honor, that some believe you the most important part of me, vital, like a heart a man gets the thrill of bursting where he can see it, that blood is owed to him. And that's the heart of it, isn't it? Of a woman, you, the only blood, worth anything. Still life with hemorrhage. A wine crate for a nightstand, and on it, a rose gone bad in a cup. It's water, a swallow of shadow, murk of rot and sugar. Clothes sloughed, bodiless, and half eaten on a plate, a plum in its juice. At the center of the scene, a woman on a mattress on the floor. Her arms cast out as if preparing to fly or as if pinned, savior or specimen, still asleep, day breaking through the window, a warm wake, the woman in its spotlight, like a halo, as if something holy, or at least chosen. Testimony. There is a God and there is no God but him. He has many names and answers to none. On the day of judgment, I will be called by my name and by the name of my father. My name, the dark I was forged in. Dark which rehearses its return while I sleep. Indeed, one day I will return to God as it is to him that I belong. Indeed, this was part of the message and the message was received. I do not speak for God, and he does not speak to me. This in arrangement, estrangement. When asked my religion, I answer, surrender. I pray with my head to the floor, with my hands where he can see them, with both eyes closed. All this for paradise, 
which lies at the feet of mothers, beneath my feet, the temporal earth, which darkens where I stand. Annunciation. All night, I leak a shadow from the place I first learned shame. All night, the milky curve of the moon pressed to the window like an ear. God, I know you are there. You are everywhere. And yet you fixed her in a shaft of light and sent a man who would not touch her, frightened though she was. You were there in the room, as you are here in the room, in the dark through which I beseech you. The man beside me slumbers messageless, unwinked. All night I listen for you listening. If there is something you need to tell me, God, you must tell it to me, yourself. I think I'm going to end there. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leila. Um, I'd like to now call on um, Rowan back to the virtual stage. Um, and uh, let's have a nice uh, chat about, um, about your books, which, which, which just came out this year. Um, I've, got, I've actually got a couple questions, and, and all of, uh, each of them go out to both of you. Um, so my first, uh, what I'd like to know, so like Starling Days and Deluge talk um, about illness, primarily physical and mental, but spiritual as well. And it's worth noting that the primary figures of both books are women. Uh, in your work, that I, I find that you both refuse to be didactic, and there's no like strict definitions for notions of illness and wellness, recovery and deterioration. So could you speak more on how your work uh, like tackles these ideas? Would you like to go first, Rowan? Oh, I was gesturing you could if you if you wanted to, <laughs> um, but um, I don't mind. I think um, I became uh, hyper aware, I guess, of of illness when it um, you know really took over my body. Um, but uh, something that I, I I think I kind of explored in the book and certainly in, in writing it, um, I began writing it when I was sick, and then I finished it af after, if I can say after. Um, after that particular experience. Um, and I think what I, one of the things I was working through was realizing I didn't think I was ever really going to stop being sick, um, either mentally, like mentally thinking about it or just sort of, you know, the body finds its ways into deterioration in a number of ways. And in my particular um, case, I, had, I hadn't um, been given some sort of all clear. Um, you know, I knew that it was going to come back one day. Um, so, so knowing that um, it was an interesting thing to write about, it sort of was like a, a pause, um, but it wasn't like it was something over. And it felt certainly like it would, it was haunting me in, in many ways. Um, uh, I don't think I, I don't think I could trust that I was well, you know, I think that I, I started to doubt what wellness meant. Um, and if I would be able to ever really feel safe in my body again, or that I recognize um, it as, as something, you know, you lose a certain sort of, sight or, or being when you when you go through something like that. Um, you know, the innocence and uh, arrogance, I guess, of use where you think, you know, you'll go on forever um, healthy um, because you've been blessed with health. Um, you know, that, that just vanished for me pretty fairly young, I guess, in my early 20s. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever get something like that back. Um, so for, for me, uh, writing this book, um, it was it was very much an investigation of what it meant to to be sick and then to sort of live in a body that um, will endure other things if not this particular thing. Um, I don't know if that directly answered a question, um, but I hope I hope some of that question was answered in, in my answer. No, I think I think that that's a, I was really that's a really beautiful answer. Um, I think for I wanted to speak a bit to the question of gender, at least how I was thinking about it in my book. I think there's this weird double bind that women can find themselves in where your emotions are attributed to your body. So we, you know, we don't, uh, in studies of social, doctors don't listen to women describe their own physical symptoms and often attribute it 
to sort of emotions or feeling and that you know that goes way back we all know about the not all known, but it's a well-known thing of this sort of Greek hysteria is your womb moving around your body issue. So it's, which is the other side of it, which is that then when a woman tries to say, these are my emotions, people go, oh no, that's your body. And somehow you therefore can't describe either your body or your emotions reliably or be a reliable narrator of that. And I think when you're constantly told that it can be very undermining. So this character doesn't have one concrete reason for her depression. She's Asian American, that's a particular challenge. She also finds out she has polycystic ovaries and she's sort of quite cross about it. But when she finds out that depression's comorbid, she sort of feels like it's an anti-feminist possible thing, but also why didn't she know about this? And, you know, and she's sort of always trying to figure out is what's going on physical or mental or spiritual or other. And sort of trying to navigate that landscape, I think is made very fraught as a woman, but this book, and I didn't read to you from her husband's point of view, but also is from her husband's point of view. And he sort of encounters some of the opposite problem, which is he also has emotions. He, despite being a man, is a full human being, but often feels that he, it's not okay for him, either because he's the caretaker or because he's a stronger person to talk about those, and that that has its own problems down the line in the book. So yeah, I, I, I don't think pain of any sort is exclusive to women but I think society pushes us through different horrifying tunnels to deal with it absolutely yeah um so I have another question so um in Starling Bay's Mina is a classicist whose studies of mythological women informed the larger arc of her life and in Deluge there's a lot of cross-referencing with primarily the Holy Quran and the Bible and two poems at the end weave together text from I counted over 70 different sources. Um, I'd like to know more about your relationship with texts in your writing. So how do you consider your work both formally and thematically to be in conversation with these broader and, and earlier narratives, right? Mm -hmm. I felt um, in writing Deluge, um, I'd been told early that, that basically there was no room for a book like this that, that um, women writing about their bodies had already been done in like the 90s and that, you know, why was I bothering basically? Um, and of course, you know, I was told that by a man, um, but I really felt concerned that my subject was not literary, that, um, you know, I was terrified when I realized that these poems I'd been writing was, was likely going to be my first book and what would that mean for me as a writer? Would I be like pigeonholed as like, oh, that's just Layla who writes about, you know, menstruation or something and, and that's it. And that's all that she has to say and let's dismiss her. Um, so I was really afraid of that. And I wanted to, to try and assert that what I was writing was important um, and, and had a place in sort of a long lineage of literature that it wasn't some sort of, um, I don't know, like a girly project that I'm doing, you know, in my, in my bedroom or something um, for fun. Um, so I wanted to be in conversation with this long history of, of, of a lot of women suffering um, and, and just sort of also general grappling with faith and doubt and, and our bodies. Um, and I knew that I wasn't alone in that. So, so some of the, the research that I did, um, is certainly in the beginning when I was sick, came from a real searching to try and find other people that had experienced what I experienced or trying to read um, scripture because I was afraid of my mortality and I was trying to understand um, you know, what might be coming after or why might I be in this position in the first place. Um, and I was drawn to, to biblical women, particularly Mary, um, because I, I, their stories were so obscured from, from view, but they are also um, you know, like archetypal. And, and I wanted to know um, you know, if Mary is this, this huge female figure, sort of the female divine, what would it have been like to have her body sort of hijacked in this way um, that's like famously held up as something good happening, but the likely was very terrifying. And so I really wanted to sort of investigate how scripture, which I had been raised so heavily and talked about women and women's bodies. Um, and then I, I just was reading all the time to sort of sometimes reading against my interest in terms of reading um, men who had very negative opinions of women, um, just to be able to sort of know what I was dealing with, both like medically and spiritually, um, but then also reading folks who were grappling with 
with doubt and trying to establish myself in that conversation to say that, you know, this is, um, this is a text that's in conversation with Rilke, or, you know, this is a text that's, you know, that's, that's talking back to some of these, you know, larger spiritual um, and intellectual thinkers, um, and that its subject matter doesn't um, kind of isolate it from it, but it, it's just one of, one of many, you know, there's many, many women who have suffered um, famously, and, you know, we were, uh, like, what do you call them, um, like mystics and things, you know, right, so I, I kind of was interested in this idea of, um, why do we sort of respect this at a distance, but when it comes into our contemporary lives, it's something that's like dismissed as not not real or not serious um, thinking, I guess. Yeah. I was so, so taken away thinking about your answer. Um, that, that was lovely. Um, so I think for me, it was partially sort of when I was thinking about the needs of that particular character, so we sort of mentioned that the book is in part about depression and it talks about sort of the physical aspect and the mental aspect. And I, I felt that the character herself did not want to be sort of shuffled off into this corner of like sick people over there. We let's look at this sick person. And so she's very much trying to connect to a larger story of what it means to suffer of how you survive. She's, Right, she's trying to write um, essentially a long essay about the women who survive myth because they basically keep dying and transforming, and sort of. And she's thinking about like, what does it mean? How much can you transform and have it still be you? And it's all. And she, I'm talking about her like she's a real person, but she was a real person to me when I was writing her. She really cares about the myths in and of themselves. That it's even though she knows, for example, that Persephone is probably not real, that describing a child leaving and coming back to her mother feels like a true way of speaking about the seasons and sort of that, to try to get those truths that can't be got by frantically Googling Web, WebMD in the middle of the night uh, and finding another, another sort of story. So that felt very necessary, I think, for that character and I was also thinking about the ways in which one of the reasons I love myth is that it's constantly being rewritten like essentially the Romans just write like a lot of Greek fan fiction you know where they repurpose it for their own needs and to tell their own stories and that we just keep doing this downtime and I wanted to give this to an Asian American woman who doesn't look anything like the classicists that sort of one might imagine being the people who have the right to interpret these stories, but who did represent people I know who aren't necessarily like old Englishmen in bow ties. So, you know, they exist too. Thank you, Rowan. I've got one last question um, from me and then we can move forward to questions that the audience have. Um, but I would also really want to know, so like for the both of you to borrow like this terribly corny phrase, like this isn't your first rodeo. Um, Rowan, you've already published uh, Harmless Like You a couple years ago and you've edited an anthology. Layla, this is your full length, but you've got um, two chapbooks, you know, um, uh, Tunsia, Amrikia, and Ebb. So I'm really curious, like, have there been any revelations or discoveries about either writing or, or publishing or even yourself throughout the process of writing, you know, these second-ish books, second books and second-ish books, uh, third-ish? Um, and did it feel the same as the first time you were putting out like a book into the world? That's a great question. Um, I, I wrote the three is sort of in the same time period. Um, really, it kind of began in 2015 and it went, the, the bulk of it happened from in 2015 and 2016. And I finished Deluge in 2017. So that took a little extra little hiccup of time. Um, but I think of, of those as being kind of coming from this real like swell of writing where I was writing constantly and they were distinct projects. I never thought of them as being somehow merged. Um, but it was just a lot of writing. Um, and with the chat books, I felt very excited because it was sort of something that felt almost not like a fluke, but that I didn't, it, it was, it was, it came very naturally just writing those poems. Um, and the project felt less pressurized. I think, you know, there's all the uh, kind of businessy side of things that comes with a full length book where certain opportunities and things 
um, are open but also closed off. And so I think I was uh, scared of like crossing that threshold. And so for the chat books, I felt like I can do kind of whatever I want with these because it doesn't really matter. It can only bring me kind of good things. But if I publish a book and somehow it wasn't the book I wanted it to be or something, then maybe maybe that will hurt my career, hurt, hurt me. Um, so I was much more scared of the book. And I guess the book felt heavier. I mean, you, you mentioned, Mishka, um, the research, and I did. I researched a lot for that book, um, whereas the, the chapbooks, no, I didn't. That was much more sort of like rooted in, in personal observation and experience um, alone. Um, but after the, the, after the book was finished, finished, after Delia just finished, I entered like a period of real um, depression and, and uh, silence. I couldn't write for a really long time. Um, I think I was Kind of terrified of like what next and like do I have how do I how do I endure another span of, of writing like that how do I get into another project knowing that it's going to take me that level of effort I was so exhausted um after writing all of that work um and scared I think of like I don't know like what else is there possibly to to look at inside of myself and am I ready to do that because deluge really did unearth some some things about myself and my life that I, I, I don't know, it wasn't easy. It was, it was hard to like kind of look that closely at, at things like shame and, and grief and um, fear. I think that fear is a big part of the book. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think I was ready to do that. So for like, a, I guess like two years, uh, I really wasn't writing much. I, I was trying desperately, but I also was sort of like, it was like there was two parts of me, one part that wanted to write and one part that was really afraid of starting something new, of looking hard at myself or doing like difficult work. Um, and I only really was able to, to sort of write again um, at the beginning of this year before the pandemic sort of hit. Um, but I've been doing that by, by making it a game, um, by playing games with poetry as opposed to, um, you know, trying to kind of, it's like hiding the broccoli and like some ice cream or something, you know, I'm like, okay, you're sitting down at your desk and you're writing, but it's just a game. It's a game. It's not real work. Um, so I think slowly I'm dipping my toes back in my by writing poems that for me feel very playful um, and that are usually rooted in form um, because it's like a challenge for me. Um, so it's like, it's like I'm doing my daily puzzle as opposed to, you know, em em embarking on the next big project. Um, so that's how I'm tricking myself right now, but it did change. It changed my relationship to writing um, a lot, I would say. So the broccoli, I like the, I like the broccoli. I do think there is something like we'll start, maybe we don't, I, I hate, I always want to stop like say we all and then be like, no, no, there are exceptions. But many of us, I feel like come into writing from a place of play, from a place of childhood of storytelling. And I feel like so much of the work as an adult is to take yourself back there. And I think for me, both of my books came from a place of like joy and desire to write and love of imagery and also a place of deep fear. And my first book, a lot of, there was a lot, I had a lot of fear that no one would ever read it. And then my second book, I had a lot of fear that people would read it. Turns out those are both scary. Who knew? And um, so it was, it was different, but also the same. And in between Harmless Like You, which is my first novel, and Starling Days, I actually wrote an entire draft of an entire other novel and edited it two times. And it was not working. And I sent it to my agent with like a note being like, this doesn't work. Don't hate me for sending it to you. Please tell me how to fix. And she was like, well, can't tell you how to fix. There are two novels in this novel and they are eating each other. That was not a happy day because I had to go to a festival like an hour later and people were like, so how would you write a book? And I was like, I don't know. But I, I was like, no, you persevere, you try every day inside going, I don't know. Um, and what the problem I had realized later was that that book that doesn't exist came from a fight between my desire to write the book that was really important to me and the desire to write a book that was written for like, my imaginary reader enemy and I love my readers but like the one reader who you believe has put down like thrown your book upon the floor and said this is terrible for all of these reasons and I somehow like wanted to win I was like I'm gonna write a book that that person will like 
and also that I will like, and that you, you can't write a book for that person. It's just, it's not gonna work. And so I then had to put that manuscript away and never look at it again and start again and start thinking about what really deeply concerned me and what mattered to me in a book. And that's what Starling Days became. The end. Thank you. That's 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 uh, really good. Like um, foreseeing advice. Like things. What to expect when you're expecting a book? <laughs> yeah. um, now let's let's move forward. Um, there there are a couple of questions from the audience. Um, some of them are are individual questions, and some questions are for the both of you. Um, let's start with so this one. Um, this is for Rowan and uh, our our audience member, our, our our guest, our friend wants to ask. Um, so the Rowan. Quote, the, Rowan, the narrator is so honest and vulnerable. How do you create a character who is so flawed and so realistic? Thank, thank you for asking that and for asking it so nicely, audience member and friend. Uh, I, I think for me, what I love most as a reader is moments of recognition, not necessarily of myself, although of myself is great, but just of like, this is what it means to be a human. This is the way that people are. I know that's not what everyone goes to books for, but I often find like supposedly likable or aspirational protagonists like not enjoyable. I just, I, I just not my pleasure. My pleasure is like someone like describing some weird brain tick that I'm like, wow, I've never found a way to talk about that. And so I think for me, when I'm writing, my goal is not, I care about the character. So I hope my reader cares about them, but it's not it's not to create characters who are sort of in some ways above the reader or better than the reader or super magical in that way. And so I tried to just think about this person and what her concerns would be and how maybe if all of these concerns were piling on top of her, she might start to be a bit oblivious when it comes to being a good partner and that that might not be her fault, but it also might not be her husband's fault for finding that difficult. And I, yeah, I guess I'm just really interested in thinking that most people, there are some people who are kind of assholes, but most people are trying their best and most people are fucking up. And <laughs> those are the people I want to write about. Thank you, Rowan. Um, this next one's for Leila. Uh, audience member says Layla exclamation point throughout deluge the speaker cycles between reckoning with the body caught in illness and the reclamation of that body in the end the speaker seems squarely in the sense in the space of reclamation so were you aware of this movement moving towards reclamation even gradually as you were writing the book um or was it was that cemented later in the process of like assembling and ordering the collection that's a great question um so when I started writing the book, I didn't know I was writing a book. I was in my MFA um, in North Carolina State. And um, I was writing these poems because it was the only way I really knew how to process my thoughts. And it still kind of is the majority of the way I process sort of my experience and my feelings. Um, and so I was writing them, not thinking that I would ever do anything with them. Um, and certainly not envisioning a book. When my mentor, Dorian, told me that I'd been working on my book, um, when I showed her sort of this handful of poems and was like what do I do with these um and I thought it was a chat book and she laughed and said it was going to be my book and that was horrifying to me um because I I thought my book was years and and you know years away that I would have all this time to play and sort of you know be I don't know experimenting and reading and things like that and not really having to worry about the responsibility of working on a, a book um and so I was really frightened uh, so those earlier poems were were very much immediate experience. So me like in the literally, in, I would go from my workshop to the hospital to do exams and to have tests. And I defended my thesis two days before I had a surgery. So like it was always so embedded, like the directness of the physical um, experience because it was like a weekly concern um, daily for what was happening to my body, but weekly in terms of like going to the doctor and sort of having, you know, my body be examined in that way. Um, and so I, and those poems, I couldn't distance myself from my body because it felt so oppressively present. Um, and I couldn't really see any sort of like metaphorical experience in it. It really was just like, oh, I'm very sick. And this is, this is what it means to be sick. Um, 
as I wrote afterward, um, my final surgery was in 2015. Um, and so I wrote for about a, you know, two years, three, two and a half years, three years afterwards. Um, and that's when I was able to sort of think more about like, okay, now you're out of the immediacy of like, it's right in your face. Um, what did that mean? Um, that's where I started to do more of the sort of investigation of gender and shame and faith um, from more of a distance. And about reclamation, um, I did have like a strange period after my surgery where I felt very, very, very grateful for my body. I don't know if that's, I haven't done enough um, research, I guess, to know if that's something that's common after like a near death uh, sort of kind of confrontation. But I remember being like very body positive for like the first time in my life um, because I, I was okay again. Like I went through such physical um, turmoil and then, and then suddenly it was working and it was like working in ways that I hadn't had to do that for a while. Um, I was very grateful. Um, but then that sort of went away again. It's like you thought, I thought, I remember thinking like, I'm just going to stay in this state forever and I'm going to be so grateful for my body and the things it does for me. And inevitably like life comes in and it does its, its stuff on you and you start to be ungrateful again. Um, and so when I finished the book was in 2017 and I was still in a place of some gratitude because it had been behaving itself until that point, more or less. But I also um, had some some real trepidation because I, I was always sort of in fear of when is it going to come back and, you know, sort of hyper aware of my body's workings, um, you know, in, interpreting every sort of thing. It's like, oh, is it is it back yet? Is it coming back yet? Um, so I think the, the book ends in a place of sort of gratitude and, and some embracing of my body to know that it had gotten me that far. Um, but with some real fear, I think of like the final poem, Deluge, which is a, a cento, a combination of, of different voices, different lines from, from lifted sources, um, as it's sort of swinging backwards and forwards between um, gratitude for God, anger towards God, safety, unsafety. Um, and it doesn't really, there isn't really resolution. I never really reached a point where I felt, oh, that's all done and closed and we're all better. Um, it sort of was more like if it's a long, long, long continuum or long path, and I don't actually see an end anywhere in the future for it. I'm just farther along that path. Um, and at this point, it's particular, it's calm. So I think that maybe, maybe calm is the way to describe it. I was in a, a, a respite uh, period of, of, you know, of ease at, the, at that point when I finished the book. But I, I'm curious about if I'd finished the book this year, for example, what the ending of that book would look like. Um, I think it would be different. So the, the person I was at the end of 2017 was someone a little, maybe um, leaning more toward reclamation than I guess the other side. Thank you, Leila. Um, this next question is for Rowan. Rowan, how, do you, how did you come up with an ending that neither denies the severity of meanness depression nor leaves the reader hopeless? No spoilers, but the ending felt hopeful um, beyond all odds. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I don't know how to talk about this very well without talking about what happens at the end of the book, which hopefully some of you will read. So I'm not, I'm gonna try not to do that. But I think I'll talk about what I was thinking about before I wrote the ending and what I wanted from the ending. So I think the thing is, it's sort of, Write it like if you like at a party to be like, what are you writing about? And be like, oh, I'm writing a book about depression. People are like, great, okay, backing away. Um, but I actually, it was something that I didn't find to be hopeless because I've had various people when I was much younger. Um, I suffered from depression, but I've also had various people I've really loved, who I will not reveal their medical history, but I really care about, um, go through different mental um, states. And I think basically, if you're not dead, you're still fighting. Like that, that, it, that it's, it's a hero's journey. It's not a hero's journey that has any dragons in it, but you are real literal dragons, but you are fighting. There's a force that is trying to say, in, in the case of clinical depression, you should be dead, or you should at least not get out of bed ever again. And there's another force that says, no, I, I want to. And sometimes the most pain doesn't just come from the first one, it comes from the conflict 
between the two of them but that I think that conflict is often what books are about and that in some ways that's what this book is about and I didn't I didn't want an ending that was like oh and then it was all better but I also didn't want an ending that denied that part of her that thought that yeah she was just like a waste a waste of space like we should chap chapter one when she was on the bridge we should just ignore that woman from now on like I, I didn't want to write a book that spoke to that either so I, I had to worm my way into an ending thank you Rowan I've got one last question for both of you and oh this is a it's a, it's a craft question um for both of you how do you construct the images metaphors and similes in your work someone's trying to write a paper I guess um, what, what do you see as your goal with them, with these images, metaphors, and similes? Would you like to go first? <laughs> I can go first, it's exciting. Um, so I think for me, there's sort of two goals. One is, so we were talking about earlier about that feeling of reading something and being like, yes, that's how to describe that. And I think sometimes I go to metaphor or simile for things that we don't have pre-existing language for, because I'm trying to describe something that I don't have words for. And so you're like, well, it's like this thing or it makes you feel like this thing. And the second reason I go to them is, especially in Starling Days' book is always in third person, but it's in a third person that is very close to Mina and Oscar because it's, it's sort of, it's the story of their relationship and I wanted to stick with their perspectives. And so the metaphors, that are used are the metaphors that they are reaching for. So Mina at one point, this is fairly early on, it's not a spoiler, begins to develop feelings for a woman in her life. And she very consistently describes that woman in terms of sweetness and sweet foods. Um, although also there's still some other imagery. And it's not that I believe as the omniscient narrator that if you saw this woman in the street, you'd be like, ooh, sucralose. But for, for it's a way of describing Mina's desire to grasp onto this woman and to un, and the language she's using about her, which sort of describes for her her desire. And I think, yeah, so, Leila, you're a poet. <laughs> <laughs> I very much agree about like metaphor um, serving to, to connect to something that seems like very difficult to say sort of in a direct, um, more direct way. Like if the word is difficult to, to summon than, than using a metaphor. Um, so for me, metaphor is always meant to bring the reader closer to an experience or an understanding, not to be as some sort of like distancing technique or something. I don't believe in metaphor just thrown in for, you know, sort of flair or something that it should be useful. Um, as for image, um, I I certainly had like a kind of store of images or like a, I, so I, I have a lot of uh, kind of crafty ways that I think when I'm writing. And one of them is I do like collages and things like that. Um, so I did have like very clear literal visual images of sort of my, my mood board or something for the book, right? Um, because I was writing, um, you know, so heavily in com conversation with Mary, I was very interested in sort of like Marian iconography and like the images and metaphors used for Mary. So I was very attuned to like just specific images that, you know, like the color blue, for example, right, with Mary and how that could appear in the book. Um, I was interested in, um, you know, the dove of the Annunciation and like, you know, how the dove can show up. And I was interested, um, and, and even like, you know, there's this idea of like fruit, obviously in the Bible and the Quran. So like how fruit played into my experience, it was very surreal to, to have the doctors um, use a, a fetal like pregnancy chart to, to talk about my tumor's growth, um, which uses fruit, right? Fruit and vegetables. So it felt very natural for me to use those kind of metaphors in my book because it was so much in the language that I was hearing talk I mean, it was literal metaphor, I guess. Doctors were using these metaphors to talk about my body. Um, and then also it existed in like the literature that I'd read, um, you know, it was like, oh, this, you know, fruit of the womb and all these things, right? And, you know, the apple or the fig or whatever you want to call it, Eve. Um, and 
So for those, I wanted metaphors and images that were in line with my subject matter. I didn't want to be reaching into sort of a, like a red herring or something that's like way out there. Um, I wanted it all to be within the same vibe, I guess. Um, but something, a craft thing that um, my mentor Dorian had taught me uh, early in my MFA was asking myself if, if the poem's strange enough. So I always wanted to make sure that my images, metaphors, whatever language I was using to describe something um, was accurate and strange. I wanted it to make strange the world, which kind of makes interesting um, the world. So it like would challenge me to see more closely instead of relying on, um, you know, the, the first thing we think of is usually the first thing that many of us will think of because we're steeped in the same kind of cultural references. Um, and so pushing beyond that to what's the second thing I think of, what's the third thing? Um, and then like five things down the line might be the truest thing and also the most interesting because it took a little more work to get there than just sort of received language that I picked up just by being a human being, um, you know, listening to conversations or things like that, reading books. Um, so that's kind of how I, I moved craft wise into thinking about are all of my images exact and are they all kind of a little weird um, so that they're, they're interesting. Um, so. Yeah, but I love image and metaphor. I, I am a poet, so, so it is sort of my jam. Yeah. I, I could honestly sit here and virtually talk about like, you know, iconography and image systems and 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 grasping for for what we don't have language for, like as people. But unfortunately, I think we're a little bit running out of time. Um, but uh, on behalf of UW Madison's program in creative writing and the Wisconsin Book Festival, I'd like to thank Rowan Hisayo Buchanan and Leila Shati for gracing us with their virtual presence and sharing their masterful work with us tonight. Yay! <laughs> and I'd like to thank all of you um, for making the long drive to your computer or tablet to be here tonight. Um, the the stats came in. Um, we have we have viewers from 14 communities throughout Wisconsin, 11 states, four countries, uh, and this is like the first like Wisconsin Wednesdays thing. So hopefully we get we gain we gain more traction, and I'm glad that people, you know, um, who unfortunately are stuck in their homes uh, are are able to to come together and talk 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 uh, novels and poetry. Um, so uh, to the audience, if you'd like to purchase uh, Rowan's and Layla's books. Um, please support a local independent bookseller and place orders to our partnering stores. Um, you can find a full list of them and their contact info on our web page, um, tinyurl.com slash whiskweds, um, tinyurl.com slash whiskweds. It's going to give you um, a, a list of, of the wonderful um, independent booksellers that we've partnered with um, throughout the state of Wisconsin. And they do ship and they do um, provide curbs, curbside pickup. Um, you'll also find a list of, of, our, of our, our, our next uh, events. Um, we've got events all the way until um, end of the year. Um, so we hope you can join us at our next event. Our next event features uh, Pulitzer winner Anthony Doerr, joined by Leslie Tenorio and Quan Barry on uh, Tuesday, uh, October 6th, so for another, another Tuesday, Wisconsin Wednesdays. You can RSVP on our Crowdcast uh, and stream the event there or on the date itself. You can also access, again, like I said, a full list of events on our webpage or by subscribing to our email list, which is also on our webpage. Um, so once again, thank you for logging on. Thank you, Rowan and Leila, for reading tonight. I had such a great time. Thank you to Connor Moran behind the scenes for Manning Tech. Um, we would not be chatting here if not for him. Um, I'm Mishka Ligot uh, with the UW-Madison Program in Creative Writing and the Wisconsin Book Festival. Take care, stay home, wear a mask, wash your hands, wash your hands again, hang in there, and we hope to see you all at the next Wisconsin Wednesday. Good night.